to get through today and there are a couple of uh, updates which I think are quite exciting and I hope um, I hope that when we do the council update, um, Rose will jump in and just and just uh, explain what they are, some things that are coming forward, uh, and hopefully that it'll be a fruitful and productive meeting. So I'm going to um, first of all just I just ask for uh, uh, comments on item two, which is the minutes of the previous meetings. Everybody. I think John John Violet got his hand up first, and then Vanessa had her hand up after that. So John John's got his hand up, Karen. Yeah, okay. So just a, just a yeah. mistake under item seven. Um, it, when I talked about the disused disused railway line, I should say between Tatton Hall and Whitchurch and the bridges on it, um, it's recorded as being Satan Hall, not Tatton Hall. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I think John. Satan Hall, I think Satan Hall's where the uh, Abigate College is, isn't it? Okay. We're just creating our own uh, our, our own um, beefdoms yes, here, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it, well, we'll amend that, John. Thank yeah. you, uh, Vanessa. Uh, yeah, I think the minutes are, are correct in as much as what they say, but actually, in terms of the um, active travel England self assessment that was promised to be sent out, I certainly haven't seen it. I think it's okay. been made public on the it's public on our website now, Vanessa, but Christie's on the call and be able to. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it should be on the website and apologies if, if there was a commitment to send it around. I clearly haven't done that. If you can't find it, please let me know and I will circulate that. Definitely. Can okay, you put thanks. the link in the chat, Christy, just while we're on the meeting so everyone can I'll have a look. Yeah, I'll just yeah, okay. take thank thanks. OK, thank you. Um, so, OK, I'm going to move on to item three, which is the Active Travel Fest update from Steve Densley. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen, so hopefully this is uh, this is going to work. So hopefully you should be able to see that. Um, if I start the slideshow, um, hopefully everyone can see the screen now, so I'm uh, th this is a, a similar presentation to so the one that I gave to the crowd, uh, so apologies if you've seen it already. Um, I thought the best thing to do is start with a bit of a, an overview of the Active Travel Festival, what it is and why we're actually doing it. Um, because I think there's, there's some, not confusion, but lack of clarity around the purposes behind this. It's not intended to be... behaviour change. So in order to achieve that, we're engaging with a number of different groups. Um, we're already working with the, the cycling and walking groups, but we're hoping to engage with schools, businesses, faith groups, housing groups, that sort of thing. Um, the travel, the Active Travel Festival Day itself will involve what we're calling um, pull events. So that's activities that are happening in the city centre, which will encourage people to come in on the day. Um, but come in using modes of transport that we've encouraged them to use and show them how to use in the run up to the event. So it's not just that singular uh, day and then it's all forgotten about. Um, <clears throat> Stephen Perry, who's on the call at the moment, um, is also working with some local schools um, to try and get them involved. And that's what we're calling the push is engaging with these schools, community groups, etc., to tell them how great it would be for them to support the event and learn how to use active travel to access the city beforehand. So on the day, lots and lots of people can do it at the same time to access the city centre. Um, the obvious benefits of that are the businesses in the city centre getting more people in, using active travel, spending more time there, um, clear benefits to the environment, etc. So where are we at the moment? Um, we started off some time ago now appointing a steering group, uh, which is um, Stephen Perry, Vanessa Bond, Martin Preston and myself. We meet regularly. Um, it seems to be more of a firefighting and troubleshooting meeting at the moment because there's uh, lots of obstacles being thrown our way, um, not least things like unexpected periods of perda, uh, difficulties in funding, uh, uh, losing our project manager, uh, uh, our event managers. Um, but we seem to have overcome most of, of those. Um, we have a website which is now live, uh, which is atfest.uk. 
um, and he wants to go and have a look at that. Um, we've got new branding. You can see a little bit of it on the presentation. Uh, we've launched social media, particularly Twitter. Um, so I'd encourage everyone on, on the call who hasn't done so already to search out at at Fest Chester on Twitter and uh, on followers and share any of the uh, the output we're putting out there. Um, we're in a key phase at the moment in regard to funding uh, via sponsorship. Uh, and obviously if someone wants to sponsor us and put their branding on our output, they need to see that we've got plenty of output and social media uh, is a key aspect of that. Um, we've had some seed funding from the members. Uh, thank you for those uh, that are on the call and that have contributed. That's enabled us to, to have the website build uh, completed, uh, get the social media branding done. Um, we've also engaged uh, Um, we need to find a little bit more money from sponsorship than we first anticipated. Uh, we'd hope to get 75% um, of the funding we needed through the uh, um, Cheshire, Cheshire crowd. Um, unfortunately, that scheme was oversubscribed to the tune of about 150%. Um, so instead of getting um, circa 18,500, we got circa 10,500. Um, that's left a, an £8,000 hole in our budget. Um, I've had some very, very positive conversations with Karen and Rose uh, in the Transport Directorate about potentially plugging that hole. Uh, that's a work in progress. And as I say, the uh, sponsorship programme is ongoing. Um, we've got some rather nice sponsor packs that we've uh, we've built ourselves that are going out to uh, various places at the moment so we're confident of filling that hole um we, we just need that little little extra push so anyone that's on the call who's got contacts or ideas or who can just push out our, our message to to their own groups we will be uh, very grateful of that um, primary location is confirmed. That's the University of Chester lower car park. So that's uh, opposite the Rue D. Um, we've had permission from highways and the university to put a four metre by one metre banner um, on there for two weeks prior to the event. Um, so that's going to be really key for our headline sponsor. Um, from a corporate point of view, having your branding on such a prominent location that sees about 45,000 cars a day go past it um, for around £4,000, which is what we're asking for a headline sponsor, it is peanuts. You couldn't buy the advertising for that. So on that basis, we're very hopeful of, of achieving that. Um, we've had some great support from partners. Um, uh, uh, Cheshire West and Chester have been very supportive. I've had some really good meetings just recently with both Rose um, and Karen um, about how this uh, event can support what they're doing in terms of the climate emergency, uh, local travel plans, decarbonisation plans, that sort of thing. Um, and the festival has actually is been it, named. Is it worth qualifying that that's um, Karen Stevens? Steve? Yes, sorry. Rather than yes, Karen, Karen Shaw. Stevens. No, no. Yeah, Karen and Karen's our new decarbonisation. Just in case Karen sat there thinking, gosh, I'm I'm so busy, I can't remember that. <laughs> Karen Stevens is our new decarbonisation officer, isn't she, Steve? Sorry. Yes, to sorry. Yeah, sorry. I should have clarified that. Thanks, Rose. Um, and the event's actually been uh, specifically named in the position statement that's been provided to Active Travelling, which is great. It's some uh, national recognition there. Um, I spoke with Martin Key from Active Travel England last Friday. He's the uh, head of strategy. Um, he's very keen to work with us on... Um, um, making this uh, an exemplar event, something that's repeatable and scalable, uh, that can be used um, to, to guide other events, not just across our region, but across England. Um, the, the main part of that is gathering the data around barriers and enablers, finding out why people really don't uh, use active travel, because a lot of those barriers are perceived. So what we really need to do is dig down into that. Um, to use Chester as an example, a lot of the infrastructure is already there. It's just under underutilised and not connected correctly. So we can quite easily overcome those barriers is if we really understand the people we're trying to work with and that's something active traveling and are very keen to engage with us on um, to achieve that Cheshire cycling campaign uh, has offered to uh, provide um, guided routes so if we um, have hubs around the city um, we can guide people in from there prior to the event so they know the routes they can take through low traffic neighborhoods zero traffic neighborhoods the greenway uh, uh, blue infrastructure that sort of thing um, we've got Cheshire Residents Association Group, sorry, Chester Residents Association Group or CRAG helping us with mar uh, marketing, that's uh, with Vanessa. Um, Active Cheshire, that's myself. Um, we are the um, people that were the, the headline um, business for the crowd fund because it had to be a properly constituted charity. Um, so I'm also assisting with uh, project management and um, bits and pieces. 
at the University of Chester via Martin Preston and, and Tamara. Um, they're helping us with the data collection, the analysis and the learning, uh, which is a very, very key part of this. Um, and I'm also working with the, the NHS through through Grace Marshall. We've already sent out question or, or devised slightly tweaked questionnaire um, that's going out to GP surgeries because there's a real drive across Cheshire um, to activate, activate GP surgeries, not only through the Active Practice Charter, um, but directly to use Active Travel. We've got a great case study from Stuart Leach at Northgate, who already has ditched his car in favour of using his bike to go on, on patient visits. So that's the sort of thing we're trying to encourage across Cheshire. So we've got the uh, the ICB um, are on board um, supporting us with that. And again, it's a great source of data for the barriers and the enablers. Um, and again, CCC have said they're quite happy to devise routes from each of the surgeries into the city centre. Um, so on the day, people can actually use those uh, defined routes, um, which again are pretty much already there. It's just a question of people learning about them. Um, so this isn't about building new infrastructure and building a great big cycling superhighway. This is just about getting people to use what's already there, understanding how nice it is, how easy it is. Um, it doesn't cost anything, so we've got a cost of living crisis at the moment. Um, so rather than spending a fortune on petrol or diesel and parking, just cycling or walking. So all, all those sort of um, uh, that, the, that information we can pass out to people via the event and the build up to the event is, is vitally important. And the networks such as the ICB are, are vital in getting that out. Um, so let, let's have a look at who benefits and how. Um, for the local residents, it's just a question of trying active travel, finding easy ways to access the city. Um, and if they discover they can get into the city in 15 minutes on their bike and find a nice secure place to park it, and it doesn't cost them a penny, rather than spending ages trying to find a parking space and that sort of thing, that's a benefit to them and their health and well-being. And it brings communities together, because um, people don't tend to do this just on their own. They'll get a group of people to do it at all at the same time. Local businesses, um, I had a really good meeting with Carl Critchlow from BID uh, last week. Um, I've agreed to put a paper together um, specifically talking about the benefits to um, the, the, the businesses um, from active travel. There's lots and lots of studies out there that show there's a, a much greater dwell time within the city if people use active travel to access it rather than private cars because they're not thinking, oh, when's my parking run out and um, or, or do I click over to the next level of uh, charging on parking? So they'll tend to spend about 30% more money in the city, which is obviously a great benefit, um, but it, it's really making that uh, apparent and um, uh, to the local businesses to, to get their support. Um, already mentioned community. Uh, it was with regards to the council, there was a climate emergency response plan. There's a decarbonisation plan. We have a decarbonisation officer now um, and the local travel plan, all of which um, state that active travel uh, is, is a key strand in achieving net zero. Um, so by using this as a, a, a way of encouraging people to use active travel, not just on the day, um, but ongoing afterwards it is, is going to be a great help to the, to the local council. Um, Active Travel England, I've already touched on this, they're very keen to gather the data. They are a brand new department, um, still massively understaffed, uh, but the data around barriers and enablers are going to be vital to their programme going forward, to, forward in, for many years. Um, so they're very keen to work with us on that. Um, with regard to the NHS, um, healthy communities um, is going to reduce the burden on the NHS. They're keen to decarbonise. The easiest way to, to do that is to get less people using it. And if people are cycling, walking, wheeling and doing things that keep them healthy, they're less likely to need to access the, the traditional uh, forms of, uh, of, of healthcare via prescriptive uh, medicines and uh, that sort of thing. So again, a great benefit to the NHS. And finally, uh, and certainly not least, is climate. Um, if we're not using private cars to get into the city, uh, it's reducing carbon emissions, improves air quality, uh, and makes life a lot nicer for everyone. So the final message on this, um, it's not just a one-off event. We're trying to drive behavior change and modal shift, um, and that, that benefits all of the people that I've just listed. Um, so I shall stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions or, or, or comments and I shall uh, endeavour to answer as best I possibly can. Um, so yeah, I've got a couple of hands up here, so. I don't know who, who was first, so uh, well, can, I, can I start with Rose? Oh, thanks, Steve. Rose. Well, Steve, it's just a vote of thanks because I know how much effort all of you and the team have been putting into this. And I think the way it's coming together, the shape, the form, 
you know, the real kind of direction you're you're giving it is just absolutely outstanding. And just want, on behalf of Cheshire West from an officer perspective, I just want to really, really thank you for everything that you've done, the conversations you've had. And then just to just to pull up um, the point, not, not pull up, sorry, just to reiterate that point that, that the way that Karen and you are working together and Karen's doing the audit of the, the cycle routes in preparation for what information we put out, are they legible? Um, what's our accessibility protocol around them. So I know that she's working quite practically with you, isn't she, to make sure that the cycle routes that we've got sort of um, around Chester are, are maintained and legible and all of those. So hopefully that practical support is is what you need from us currently as well, Steve. Yeah, so absolutely. vote of thanks and just a reiteration of kind of what Karen's doing to support on that as well. So thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I echo that, Steve. Um, really the progress that you've made in the time since we last met has been uh, exceptional really and it's a pleasure to see and I mean I, I had some practical questions around sort of funding challenges because I'm hearing different things and I don't feel as though I understand where you're at so maybe we could have a chat about that after the meeting and see see if there's anything I, I can do to to help with it yeah that'd be um, great. thank you okay that, that that'd be great um I don't know if you um I don't know if I have a number for you actually but I think I've got an email so don't yeah, worry. I'll, I'll drop you an email with all my details on okay. um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get together. OK, great. All right. Uh, thank you. Bernadette, can I bring you in? Yes, thank you. And, and thanks, Steve, echoing what everybody said and, and great to be working with you from the NHS. I'm representing the Integrated um, Care Board um, in Cheshire. There's so many things that are linking to this. Um, I suppose overriding is the health benefit. Um, we're doing specific work um, with all the sort of what we call the statutory partners. So we've got a, a, a Cheshire West and Chester, um, well, a Cheshire West um, sustainability network that includes all the health partners, um, clearly the local authority and Karen's joint that group which is really helpful but also the fire and police um, as well so we're trying to link up all those who've got similar targets for net, for net zero and active travel is a key part of that as well as what Steve's mentioned we have actually been successful in securing um, a project a national project on called step up a gear modal shift for active travel so that's where the links with the GP practices across Cheshire comes in, and that's what we're really trying to focus on. But the learning from that and hopefully then the culture and behavioural shift, we can cascade into other services. Um, I just thought it might be worth mentioning two very specific things, one of which is the Countess of Chester have got now quite extensive facilities on site for, for staff who are cycling. So that's a great addition and, and certainly better than anywhere else in Cheshire to, to have that facility because um, that was one of the fed back. They needed showers, they needed somewhere secure for their um, equipment, bikes and their gear. So all that's now a great, a great new facility that's that's opened. Um, and also we're working with Cycling Without Age. And I don't know, Steve, whether they are linked in. For anybody who isn't aware, they're, they're, um, it's a national organisation, but there is a chapter in Chester, Chester um, and this is where trishaws are provided by volunteers um, for people with disabilities. So that could be older people, could be could be children. But we're working with them to hopefully secure some additional funding through some of the housing development funding. Um, and that's great. We also commissioned uh, with our uh, social care colleagues, a lot of the caring care homes and that opportunity for people to be out and improve their health and well-being and just their outlook on life, life is tremendous. So there's so many linkages to the work that we're doing and it'd be great I suppose if we could include in the at, at fest the those with disabilities the wheeling side of it I think yeah, is, is a really um certainly important part for us from a from a health a wider health point of view yes Thanks. definitely that that's absolutely what we want to do it has to be inclusive uh, I mean active travel we define as cycling wheeling and walking um so yes it, it, it does need to be inclusive and and uh, it, it it's it's great the support you're giving and um yeah looking forward to working working closely with you. Is, is it worth me just quickly saying, Bernadette, that I have a working group with Russ and um, do you, I Justin, always forget her name. No, no, a lady. I'll, it'll come back Jill, to Jill, I think it'll Jill, be Jill, Jill probably Jill, from yeah. the Countess. Apostle. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So we, we have a, a, a monthly um, senior update on everything that they're doing and they're plugged into us so that we can ensure that they've got everything that they need from us, whether that's a, a, a re funding the collaboration so hopefully they're feeding into you 
Uh, yes, definitely. They're very active partners in, in, in what we're doing. And also and Cheshire West, sorry, we're all in Cheshire Partnership Trust, which delivers the mental health and community health services in Cheshire West, have just appointed us their own dedicated sustainability manager as well. So I think they're going to be more active. So the part, there's great there's great strength in the NHS partnership, but then linking that to wider partners as well. So uh, fantastic. Lots Sorry of for jumping in there. Karen. No, it's really helpful. And it's quite good. I suppose part of me mentioning it is so the members of this group are aware of some of the, the, the broader things that we may not be reporting on fully here, but lots of work taking place uh, out in uh, the, the NHS facilities. Thanks very much. Yeah, it is, um, it's really good to hear. And um, yeah, re really, really support the partnership working because that's how you get things get things moving. So, th so thanks for that, Bernadette. It's really helpful. Can I ask um, Vanessa? You got your hand up next. Vanessa yeah, Bond? Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, just following up what you're saying about partnership working. I mean, Steve and Stephen are, are, are doing an amazing job um, and have really sort of, you know, sort of moved things along. I've been involved on the brand ID and the website kind of things. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of this, I mean, it, it's going to be all those messages are going to go out there through the comms. And we've already reached out, as Steve said, to Carl Critchlow from BID who's committed to working with us to push it out through their channels, because obviously we really want to demonstrate the, the, the benefits to business. Um, Nicola, sadly, is obviously leaving Marketing Cheshire, so um, that's going to be a loss and not quite sure when her replacement sort of hits, um, somewhere probably about March, I think, from off the top of my head. Um, but of course, before we get to that stage where we've got the, you know, sort of the, hopefully the time and the budget to get the comms out there, um, we know we really need to sort of concentrate on hitting this target. So as Steve said, we've been sort of reaching out to who we think are suitable, um, suitable sponsors um, alongside our sister or sister event, Green Expo, that Mike Hogg, my crag colleagues, running. Um, but I would really urge people to sort of have a look at the Space Hive page and the standalone website, and it's just atfest.uk. So that's dead easy to remember. And you can donate again, it links you through to the Space Hive page. Um, because if we don't hit that target, which is the 20, the deadline's the 28th of February, none of this fabulous stuff that we're talking about, you know, potentially will happen. So um, I'd urge everybody, um, you can contribute from two pounds upwards, so not a massive amount, and circulate it to your networks if you would, or if you're on social media. Um, again, Steve's been doing a great job getting it out there on Twitter. Um, I'm going to try and, and uh, uh, do some stuff on Instagram, but I'll talk to you about that later, Steve. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's great that we're having this conversation as the first task force of the year. But like, we've got to do it, people. So visit the website, get it out there. And next time so we meet, it should be just, yeah, we're doing this. So what, what, just remind me again, what is the funding shortfall? You mentioned that the deadline is the 28th of February, but how much have you got remaining to, to raise? It, it's 12,000, 12, how much, Steve? We're, we're just over 12,500 at the moment, so we're, we're 50% there. Um, we, we had hoped to get a, a further 8,000 through the uh, Chester crowd, um, but because of the subscription there, um, that's not happened. So it, leaved, it left us originally uh, about 4,500 uh, to find um, ourselves, which would be one headline sponsor and a few bits and pieces, which we're quite confident of doing. Um, but it now means there's uh, 12,500 pounds to find. Um, because of the extra eight eight thousand pounds in the hole, um, and the, the thing with space have it's an all or nothing. So anyone that mm. has pledged money to us, um, if we don't hit that goal, it is refunded to them. Um, so if if a, a, a sponsor came in and said yes, I'll spend uh, I'll sponsor five thousand pounds for the events with the headline, and the event didn't happen and we didn't hit the funding, they would actually get their money back. So it's it's a no risk for them. Sorry, I was just about to sneeze then. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so so I just wanted to come back and just ask you, the Chester crowd, do, w w the £8,000 is the bit I'm not clear about, but you, the, what happened with that? Um, basically, what, the, uh, what we were told from the outset is if we could raise 25% of our target, Uh, 
thought the um, the, the the project was worthwhile and it was in line with uh, uh, their priorities. However, because the fund was oversubscribed by 150%, they couldn't give the full amount. They could only give okay. a, a percentage of it. And so they gave us 10 and a half instead of 18 and a half or, or, or thereabouts. There were, there were some um, pounds, shillings and pence around that, but that, that's pretty much the correct figure. Okay. And the Chester Charter Trustees? Um, I'm presenting to them on the 26th um, to see if I can get some additional funding from them. Okay. Right. Okay. That that's understood. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Vanessa. Um, Vanessa, did you have anything you wanted to add? Your hands still up. There was, but now you've asked me, it's gone. <laughs> it, if it comes back to me, Get your hand I'll, up. I'll I'll I'll, re I'll lower my hand in the interim. Okay. Thank you, um, Stephen Perry. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, what what I was going to say is predominantly been said by Vanessa, which is great. Just a couple of details. Um, yes, we are linked in with um, Cycling with All Ages. I've got a couple of colleagues who, who volunteer there. Uh, the, the focus at the moment is primarily on, uh, in a sense, that the, the bulk of the school community. Um, and that's what we're hitting at the moment in terms of trying to get their engagement to support what we're doing. Uh, but we all we are definitely intended to get to the um, the harder to reach uh, the, the the more disabled or the more people d dis, uh, with some mobility issues. So yeah, it's definitely on our agenda. So thanks for reminding us of that. And just to add a little detail to what um, Vanessa said on on the encouragement to to fund. I mean, I'm, we're also hoping that some um, some of our partners, um, people like uh, Sustrans, Cycling UK, British Cycling, maybe the Council of Chester. We'll also consider uh, coming to the event um, and uh, if we can persuade them to, to rent a gazebo for maybe 100, 150 pounds for, for the event, if they put that in early as a donation, then it counts against their, their costs later. So again, there's not many people on this call that can perhaps respond to that, but certainly push it out that um, makes it sound a bit negative. If we don't succeed, you get your money back. But what I am saying is we need your money now. So whether you're a charity or a local enterprise or partner that would like to support us by being there on the day, then have a chat with us, put the money in the in, in the pot and hopefully we'll all move forward. Thank you. Have you engaged the new MP for Chester, Stephen, just as a question? Um... <laughs> that's a good Actually, that's one of the few people I haven't. Uh, good point. Yes. I, okay. I don't know what she... I don't know does she, whether she has a pot of money, but yes, we, we need to include Sam. Thank you. No, but she can use a platform to raise awareness Absolutely. and encourage no. people to, to, to donate, can't she? Yeah. So yeah. very good point. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thanks very much for, for your for your comments there. Um, I'll bring Stephen Hughes in. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I've uh, used Space High for the various projects and it has some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, now that um, the, like you said, that the the money that was pulled away, um, the 8,000 gap that's there. assured that you were going to be able to get 75%. Can you not now drop the figure into eight and a half thousand to make sure that the rest is actually comes to you? Because that seems a totally reasonable step in, in my opinion. Um, and because what we've also done in the past with, because um, like I said, I, I've got a love-hate relationship with Space Hive. What we've also done in the past is told them that we've got, um, that we've got pre- um, pre-campaign funds so if you if you tell them that you've got money already as part of the campaign they can add that on as pre-campaign funds and so you can still get to the end goal while uh, while uh, yeah reassure, while kind of keeping all the other funds so um just a couple of options there should you you know in 70 odd days time as i see that you've got if you're getting really close to it it would be such a shame for all that money not to actually actually come to you simply because of the, the you know the, the the terms and conditions of the of the of space hive yeah thanks Stephen. Um, uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure they won't let us adjust the target um 
um, it, uh, we've been working quite closely with Jane Makin, who has been mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant throughout all of this. She's been mm -hmm. so supportive, an absolute star. Um, she has mentioned the uh, the the, the pre-funding, um, so we have a little bit of that, which which is a potential. Um, anything I get of um, I get from a presentation next week will go into that as well. So yes, there are options there um, that are, would account for a few thousand pounds, which would get us that little bit closer. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping all options open um, and I'm still confident we will get there by hook or by crook, but um, as is often the case with any sort of large project, there's, we, we, we seem to see see more hurdles than goals, but uh, I, I think we'll get there. OK, OK, well, just, yeah, like I said, just reports, should we get that? Thanks, Steve. Um, Vanessa, you've remembered what you wanted to add. Yeah, it was only to say, uh, and I may have mentioned it on a previous call, task force call, so if I have, then apologies. But uh, recently, CRAG um, set up the uh, local group for uh, living streets. Um, so um, we're just in the sort of, um, we're just in the throes of putting together our sort of dedicated web page for living streets. Um, but obviously we're, we're going to use, should Atfest proceed, we're going to use that as the sort of the official launch for Chester Living Streets. And in the meantime, we can once we have that web page up, which will be up next week, promise folks, um, then we'll be able to get out the Atfest stuff to the Living Streets database. Um, because obviously it would be great, you know, if obviously it's in, it's aimed at at, 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 at at Quack, but if people want to come to Chester that weekend and visit and see what a fabulous city as per Sam Dixon's maiden speech in uh, in Parliament this week, um, then that would be great. So, um, so, so, yeah. So that was the only thing. That was it, it's menopause brain, Karen. Hey, thanks, Vanessa. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, oh, we've got some more hands up now. Stephen, did you want to come back? You still have your hands up. No, my apologies. Okay, Catherine Holcroft. Hi, uh, yeah, I was just going to say well done to um, Vanessa for getting that off the ground uh, with the Chester Living Streets group. I know that she's worked really hard to do that. And I've got a meeting with. To, to do stuff there on the day as well. Unfortunately, I'm on holiday on the day of the event. <laughs> but I can help on everything running up to the event, of course. Um, I was just going to say on the actual, um, you know, like the, the space hive as well. I mean, I can pick this up with Steve, but just as a, an organisation that's looking to, you know, we want to support it, you know, we, we can put money into it, but we need invoicing and purchase order numbers and, and things like that. So it's just more the the day to day way that we can, you know, put that money in. Um, but we can have a separate conversation about that. I'm sure there must be a way around it to be able to. Yeah, potentially. To do I mean, we, we have talked about potentially running this through uh, Active Cheshire as a registered charity that we invoice and then put it into um, uh, Space Five, but then having a separate agreement to say that this will be refunded by Active Cheshire from that fund if it's not successful. Because clearly it's the same pot of money. It comes to us, yeah. then goes into that pot. And if that pot doesn't uh, meet its target, it comes back to us to then go back to you. It's a bit more complicated, right. but it is it is um, compliant and transparent in the transactional side of things. So it's it's doable. OK, that, that's good to know. Well, we'll say we're catching up with Steve and um, just after lunch and then, um, yeah, when we've got, yeah, all these things then that we can sort out, we'll move forward on and contact you directly. Sounds Brilliant. good. Thank well you. Done. OK, thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Um, do we have any any more questions for Steve or comments? I'm, I'm, I'm just from me. Thank you to everybody that's pulled this together and worked so hard on it and really looking forward to the event. And I'm also really pleased to see that you, you know, the the, the fact that we are um, putting a focus on wheeling as well, because I think that's really important and access to the city in particular for people with disability. So so I'm glad that that's front and centre. Thanks so much. Um, OK, if we have no more comments, I'm going to move on to the next item now, which is item four, and it's an update on Grosvenor Bridge. And do we have Andy Andy Rayner on the call? Yes, yes, I'm here, Karen. Morning, Andy. <laughs> Morning. Um, Morning, Andy. 
Yes, thanks very much. So it's just a quick update on, on where we are with Grosvenor Bridge. Um, we had a very productive meeting beginning of December to discuss the various options of what we can put on the bridge. As you're aware, it's all to do with putting the 20 mile an hour speed limit back on the bridge and we're looking at measures that we can put in place which will help bring down the uh, the average speeds of vehicles. We looked at various measures, um, Zebra Crossing, Pedestrian Refuge Island, where the temporary lights are now, um, from the um, Dingle Bank over to the, c the cemetery gates. Uh, we looked at raised tables near the near the um, near the bridge itself, and we even considered move. Well, considered one of the options was to remove the cycle lanes, but you'll all be glad to hear, you know, that that's that's not going to happen. We just did that as a demonstration of everything we're looking at. And um, what was agreed at the meeting was we would put a pedestrian refuge island in on Grosvenor Road on the approach to the bridge from the Wrexham direction where the traffic lights are now, which will act as a gateway into the city and into the 20 mile an hour speed limit. Um, the cycle lanes will continue through where the build out is. We have been out measured it. As we as you go over the bridge, it's about 600 meters, I think it is. Um, situation where we're with the last experimental order, where we felt the extents were too were too long, and by the time people got to the bridge, they weren't driving as, as we would like. Um, vehicle activated signs. We're going to look at um, a couple of them either side of the bridge. I'm currently consult with the sign manufacturers of whether we want to have. The sign to flash up the cycle warning sign triangle or we or the 21 hour roundel um it was a request that it flash up the actual speed and the smiley face but they're only used in temporary situations and we, we tend to move those around and i think from experience by where i live they've been up for about two and a half years and they just totally lose effect so um but i'll be going back to the group and back to yourselves about what signs we agree to at that time and as I say, the cycle lanes will will remain in place over the bridge. With regard to the pedestrian refuge island, we did get asked to look at putting a zebra in as well. What we're going to do is we're going to put the pedestrian refuge island in in the first instance and then set up some CCTV to monitor how much crossing goes on and if there's any problems with the crossing. From a with a road safety hat on, my concern with the zebra is when the traffic queues into the city from Wrexham direction, if it's a zebra, people will start crossing and then cross the whole width um, in the belief that they have the right of way because it's a zebra and they'll be masked by coming between queuing traffic into traffic coming out of Chester. So we can certainly put a zebra in if it's warranted, um, but I think in the first instance, we'll go with a ped refuge island and then monitor it and see if we can go ahead with a zebra. Um, and all being well, the works will start on site in March. We've got budget for this year. Um, I've spoken to our contract delivery team. They're well aware of the need to get this on site, on site by the uh, by the end of March. So we should see some movements beginning to the middle of March on, on construction on site. Um, and the other thing we got asked was contingencies for, and some good examples were given of within roadworks where vehicles are asked to stay behind cycles as they go through narrow areas so we'll get some signs in and have them as a contingency in case there's um in case there's a need to put more signs in what we don't want to do is obliterate the whole route into the city and over the bridge with with signs which which may not be needed so we'll get them as part of the scheme keep them in the yard and we can put them up as and when needed um if anybody's asking why some physical traffic car wasn't put in place uh, we have to be mindful of the vibration of going over a raised table at the bridge and the structure of it. Um, so that, that's why we've not gone for anything like a raised table or any, any physical traffic coming over the bridge. Um, and then once it's all in place, we'll obviously do some more monitoring, check on the, the mean speeds. I'm fairly confident it'll bring them down even further and the experimental 20 mile hour speed limit hopefully will be made permanent once we achieve the goal of bringing those mean speeds down again. Um, and that's about it for the update. Oh, short and sweet. Thanks, Andy, and thanks for all your work on this. And, and also thanks to the people that have volunteered their time to contribute um, in the in, in the in the meetings that you've been having. It's really good to hear. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that progress is being made. And it and it and it does it does sound like it's been very thorough and very well um, very well prepared. So thank you for that. Um, 
Do we have any questions or comments for Andy? Got Mike Garrett. Yeah, th th thanks, Andy. Yeah, I um, thank you for all that. Uh, just back to the signage point. Yeah. So, uh, it wasn't me that made the point in the meeting. Somebody else did about, um, you know, I, it was probably illegal to pass a cyclist on the bridge yeah. at that point. Um, and he was making the point that these signs are quite common in London. And I've been in London quite a bit the last few, two or three weeks, and that's absolutely right. So I don't think we should be shy about that. No, no, no. I'm sorry, no, Mike. It's I'm just conscious of absolutely littering the, the roofs oh, no, all no, the yeah, time. It's so more it, to do with sort of um, clutter, isn't it? Than... Yeah, um, and and uh, to be honest, what we don't do is the drivers have so many signs to, to read that they don't see the cyclists. So it's it's definitely a contingency we'll have in place because it, it, it was it was a good suggestion at the meeting. Yeah, I, I thought so, because it is, and, and it is dangerous passing cyclists yeah. uh, on that bridge. And uh, I don't think we should be shy about telling people not to do it for the sake of 10 seconds. No, no we won't, That's especially when it's been such a short short section as well. It's incredibly short distance. Yeah. So it's just a, a kind of psychological thing about being pressed by the guy behind you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> OK, thanks very much indeed. Um, can I bring Peter Grime in? Peter is our disability access officer for those of you who haven't haven't met him. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Councillor Shaw. Um, excuse me if I, if I miss it, Andy, but is that uh, is that Refuge Island going to be a controlled crossing or an uncontrolled crossing? No, uncontrolled. It's um, uncontrolled crossing. So, OK, but the idea with Refuge is it's twofold. It's to give a, a natural. Um, and you say it would be wide enough to accommodate a cycle and, and, a, and a pram or what have you. But okay. if if we need to upgrade to a controlled one, we, we certainly will. My my sort of trepidation on that, obviously, it, 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 it's I'm supportive of it. It's a it's a good measure. Um, it's my the only concern potentially would be it's a continuous flow of traffic. Then isn't it because you're slowing it down? There's not going to be as many natural breaks. It may be a case yeah. that we that we need to but keep it under review and uh, and, and see how it looks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. That's an important point. Um, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we will do that, won't we, Andy? And yeah. Yeah, brilliant. OK, thank you. Any other comments then or, or questions for Andy? Stephen Hughes. Yes, sorry, just to be clear. So there's there's one refuge at the, the, the coming in from Wrexham side, not yeah. from and not going out of the city. No, there's, there's, no. there's, there's not enough width on the chest side uh, of the on bridge. That side, so you um, but there, there will be where the 20 starts, there'll be round, rounds on the floor, 20 signs, and okay. one of these vehicle activated signs as you come towards the bridge there. OK, from that side, OK. Yeah. Is it when you said the monitoring, does it, are you able to monitor the speeds both ways? Yeah, yeah. I'd just, yeah. I'd just be curious to see whether that, um, how much an effect the, the island has on that side and whether the speeds coming in are lower than the speeds going out, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it, it always does bi-directional. OK, OK. Anyway, we'll see what the update is, I guess. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, um, and, and by the vehicle activation sign, Andy, you mean the one that flashes you are entering yeah. the 20 zone? Yes. Yeah, so it's quite yeah. it's quite visible to drivers then. Yeah, it is. And they tend to activate around about within 20, we activate at 24. Yeah. So and we can log the activations to see how often it's coming on. Hopefully it won't come on. <laughs> but... OK, that's great stuff. We look forward to an update. And Tony's just dropped a note in the chat to say he's had to leave but thank you for your attendance Tony and he's made a comment that it's good to see the progress so so thanks Andy um, I've got one more hand up before we move on and that's Mike Garrett Mike <laughs> so th <clears throat> thanks again it was just that last point that was raised um in the, again in the meeting Andy the point was made that for traffic entering the city the crossing was going to provide plenty of visibility and therefore yeah. slow the traffic down whereas traffic leaving the city would not see that and it's you go around a bit of a bend on the on the bridge yeah and then you drop down so is there a case for some kind of warning to drivers exiting the city who may be putting their foot on their accelerator yeah we have discussed this internally since the meeting of whether to place the interactive sign 
on the Wrexham side of the bridge to activate the vehicles leaving mm -hmm. the city, and that's something we'll we'll come back. It's it's okay. Uh, yeah, we 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 we've sort of toy with what 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 depending on what type of sign we go with uh, and the location. But before we put any in, we'll we'll come back to the group and let you know. And that's one of the reasons, Mike, about not having a zebra is this thing of walking out in the in the belief that traffic will stop for you, but they're not seeing you as, as you come from between parked vehicles. Couldn't get to my mute button quick enough then. <laughs> I, th I thought I was. Okay. I thought I'd pause then. <laughs> no, no, it's it's me. Um, this computer's got gremlins this morning, so apologies for that. So th thanks for that. Do we have any other questions for Andy? Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, okay. you, you're you're free to go. I'm oh, sure thank you've got you very much. plenty to be getting on with this morning. Uh, I know. I, I've just. I was just. I've just received a message actually from from Bryn, who's the the duty officer, just to tell us about the gritting route. So that was the momentary distraction because the, I'd noted that the secondary routes were uh, a challenge this morning. So they're they're up they're, they're on it now. That's what he was saying. They've just so, gone out. Yeah, they went. Yeah, I think yeah. it was eight eight. They were starting proceedings. So that yeah. was filling yeah. up. Yeah, good news. Eh? You just never can tell, can you? You think. You look at the weather forecast and you, and, and you can never really tell how, how hard it's going to hit. Sometimes it's not as bad as they say and sometimes it's worse. So anyway, sorry. For that Mike. Sorry, mute. <laughs> I'll introduce it. Uh, my colleague, Chris Rowland, who I think is now on, on the call, will actually has actually been doing the work. And uh, so I'm going to hand over to him. Thanks very much, Mike. So um, as you can see, I'm in the next room to Mike, which is why the day call will look very similar. Um, so I'm going to share a, a, a short presentation. Um, hang on. Can you see that? Let me know when you can see it. Yeah, we can see it, Chris, but I wonder if it's possible to make it larger. Uh, actually, it's as large. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, better. I can't get it any larger than that, I think. That's fine. Thank so, you. So, yeah, we um, um, approached Quack um, a few months ago now just to see if we could help on freight. And I'll explain a little bit about um, what we do. And um, probably you've heard already heard things from Mike about what MDS Transmodal does. does. Um, so we're a, a, a pretty specialist freight transport economics consultancy. We, uh, without wishing to brag too much, I think we're, we're probably a, a the or a market leader, certainly, and we are based in Chester. So um, a lot of our work's based on developing databases and modeling tools related to freight, uh, public sector clients and private sector, and we work for the major consultancies as well. So we're the sort of consults consultants. Um, and one of the, the main things we do is freight modelling at a national level. And uh, we own and operate a, a transport model called the Great Britain Freight Model or GBFM. Um, lots of origin destination data in it and uh, different modes and the potential to produce to model future scenarios. And uh, yeah, we're happy to be able to to help quack on this thing. As you can see on the left hand side, we cover all the modes of transport um, essentially. So a few high level stats. This is really just a report on progress of, of what we've been up to and some results that are, that are coming out of the work we've been doing. So some high level stats for, for the local area. Um, some numbers coming out of the GB freight model base case for 2018. Um, so there are about 9 million HGV journeys to and from the area, so with an origin or a destination, so quite a large volume of HGVs. But you also, of course, we also have lots of traffic transiting the area on the strategic road network, so passing through, generally diverting round the, the cities, the towns and cities, rather than going through them, fortunately. Another interesting issue, I think, is the modal split between road and rail. For rail, there are uh, inbound flows. Of
Um, it's about six million tons of bulk materials, raw materials, which equates to about 60,000 HGV movements of the 8.9 million. So that's less than 1% on rail is, I suppose, the, the sort of um, highlight, uh, as it were. Um, warehouses are very important as origins and destinations of freight movements for HGVs and, of course, LGVs, but particularly HGVs. And uh, uh, Quack has 16 of them in its area. Uh, lower numbers for, for an area like this than, say, in the Midlands, where lots of national distribution centres are located. Um, and the map uh, on the left hand side is showing the origins and destinations of the freight to and from the area for, for HGVs. And you can see that a lot of the movements are within the region, uh, within the local area, in fact, but across the M62 and down to the Midlands where these national distribution centres are located. And we've also shown the three main ports for unit load traffic. So things in the backs of trucks or in containers in some kind of box. And the key, the key ports for um, for this area, for importers and exporters located in this area are Dover uh, uh, for um, going to the continent, Felixstowe for um, deep sea containers and Liverpool for both um, routes going to Ireland and uh, and for containers. So that's just a sort of introduction to some um, some figures um, that we have available and produced for you. So the things apart from that, we, 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 we agreed with quite that we'd look at three areas. So there's a freight transport area, uh, data area, um, which with numbers coming out of GBFM, which we're also happy local transport model. Um, there's the modal shift issue. Um, so we just talked about road and rail. The one thing I should add is that there is, we're aware of a, a one of the companies to which those bulk flows are going is also looking at outbound flow opportunities. So there's potential for some, some growth in the future there perhaps. So that's modal shift. Um, and then finally, the area I want to focus on today is having a look at the particular issues related to deliveries and collections, but probably particularly deliveries into Chester city centre and whether there's an opportunity to minimise the impact of freight deliveries while also, uh, of course, making sure that the logistics industry is able to support the economy. Um, so we're um, in terms of our response, we're in the process of developing a local freight strategy. We should have some objectives, talk about the existing position, including some results of surveys, perhaps some modelling in the future, and then looking at various options for any potential interventions and recommendations coming out of that. And you'll see we've done some, some initial evidence gathering, mainly focusing on the survey of businesses in the city centre which I'm going to report the results of um, in outline. So the um, this is really to look at whether businesses of all kinds in the city centre have problems with deliveries or getting their collections out. Um, and we therefore produced or designed an online survey, which we designed to make as easy as possible to use, um, to fill in. And we uh, it was sent out uh, by the bid, so very much um, a lot of help from the bid for which we're very grateful. Sent out originally in October um, and people were able to fill it in through November and into early December when we decided with the bid to stop it simply because we're getting too close to the busy Christmas period. So that means the sample population with the bid members. Um, and the objective. particular issues and problems related to freight and um, and also both, so both deliveries and collections in both directions. And we're also are asked by the bid to see if there are any issues related to waste collections in the city centre. The response rate was we have received 31 responses um, and 
I understand there are about 450 members of the bid, so I don't actually know, but I'm assuming that it was sent to each of the, the bid members. Um, I suppose it depends on the uh, the email addresses that are available. So that's about a 7% response. Um, in itself, I think that suggests that uh, there aren't a lot of people who are very, very unhappy with the um, with the, the existing status quo. I think you'd have probably got a, a higher response if if people had been kind of queuing up to complain like mad about things. So who were the businesses which responded? Um, their, what's their profile? The top left, you've got the, the, the number of people working in each of the businesses. Um, and you can see the big blue one is less than than uh, 10 full time equivalent employees. So really quite small businesses, micro businesses. Um, but we also have um, quite big, about 20 percent of the businesses, the responses were from big businesses. We had some quite big names um, on the retail side, particularly who very kindly responded. Um, the top right, how do they relate to freight transport? Well, um, Getting on for 90% of the businesses receive goods deliverers. 20% um, or so ship goods out and, and some quite a lot of them using their own vehicles as well as third party operators. And about two thirds said that they were customers of waste collections in the city centre as well. So fairly kind of what we expected, probably collections were likely to be less important than um, receiving deliveries given that as you'll see bottom left quite a lot of the businesses that responded were non-food retail so getting on for two-thirds were non-food retail a few cafes and restaurants responded um, some additional food retail and takeaways and then one or two uh, additional businesses but the vast majority were retail of, of some shape or form, including and takeaways and cafes and restaurants. So again, probably a reasonable spread. I might have perhaps expected a little bit more from the uh, hospitality industry, but uh, retail uh, were the main responders. And I thought it was important just to give you a split of whether we're inside the pedestrian zone or outside and fairly even split. Um, um, but a small majority inside. Um, quite a few of the ones that were inside or outside were actually really technically inside or outside, but very close to the border, which. And so some summary results. So. Um, most people deliver only have one delivery a day. Um, at further, 16% receive two per day, and then some others receive more. But typically, people are receiving one or two deliveries a day. Again, that wasn't too surprising. The the average thing being delivered is a, is a parcel or a box. There's not much bulk. There aren't many bulk deliveries in 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 the sense of pallets or even um, rails of of garments. Garments are increasingly being delivered in in boxes, folded in boxes. And um, sixty one percent of the businesses receive deliveries between nine and ten thirty. So before the the start of before the barriers go up, more or less. And um, the one observation I make on that is that. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, the deliveries are therefore trying to get into the city centre very often during peak commuter hours, which is relatively probably inefficient for them. Um, they probably not choose to do that, although it may be that many of the businesses just want their deliveries at that time of day, irrespective of the operation of the, the time window. And the deliveries are typically by parcel operators and usually using LGVs, not exclusively, but that's the typical vehicle. So the photo is fairly representative, a white van delivering parcels of mainly ambient goods uh, in the city centre. Um, 
I wouldn't like to say it's typical that it's parked on a yellow line, but this one happens to be parked on a yellow line. Um, of course, that uh, that's one of the issues. Some of the drivers will say that we have to park, commit an offence in order to make our deliveries um, to certain locations. Uh, so what were the issues that, that emerged? This seems to me to be the most important question um, from the survey. We made some suggestions as to issues that, that people receiving deliveries might suffer from and also to make it really easy for the survey um, for them. They just have to press buttons to answer the questions. We put another column in on the right hand side, as you can see there, but um, the there weren't really many other issues. The other issues mentioned were usually complaints about traffic wardens giving tickets unreasonably in the opinion of the businesses um, for illegal parking. So the issues we think we got the issues right. So um, and the main issues that were reported as being significant were late deliveries. So perhaps the for whatever reason the delivery company vehicle getting delayed in traffic or having some kind of problem. The um, unreliability of deliveries, people not arriving when they're supposed to, and also inconvenience of delivery times, which is quite an interesting one when there's a, a time window. Um, yellow uh, columns or the green columns. So as I said, people were not queuing up to find complaints, but some businesses do regard themselves as having some significant issues related to um, deliveries and po possibly the inconvenience of delivery times is something we should investigate a little bit further. Uh, but the main focus is, is not, there's no, it doesn't seem to be a massive issue that needs to be dealt with. So it's more, um, I think, looking at whether there are ways we can improve things and make things even better. The general impression you get is that people are used to the time windows, they're used to the status quo, and they and the businesses that receive goods and the, the three PLs have adapted to, to life, life in Chester from that point of view. So what are we going to do next? Um, about a third of the respondents said they were happy to have follow up interviews, so we'll be doing that. We'll be going to talk to them, which give us a, an opportunity to have a slightly more in depth discussion with them. We're planning to see if um, uh, have do a survey of residents on a similar basis online uh, via the auspices of some of the residents associations to see if there are particular issues for them. Um, and that's particularly important given the, the likely increasing relevance of re uh, residential in uh, in the city centre and, and hospitality as well. We think it'd be worth doing an observational survey of freight movements from say eight o'clock in the morning to 10.30, um, just to see the numbers of vehicles and the types of vehicles and see if that confirms our view. Um, and so that would be a typical weekday. And I think it's also worth doing observing movements outside during when the pedestrianisation is in place, perhaps in the Weaver Street, uh, Common Hall Street area, just to see if people are parking up and walking in um, as well at that time of day. And then we'll be considering further options. We already started on this idea, but looking at whether the idea of a cycle logistic service into the city centre when it's closed to freight vehicles is something that will be welcomed. As I say, uh, particularly as it's going to be a great. Um, it would involve some kind of small hub. EVs particularly to um, cycle cycle um, e-bikes e potentially for the final deliveries. And, and the objective would be addressing this issue of whether delivery times are convenient. Um, so providing a wider time window for deliveries and collections within the city centre. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. So I don't know whether you, anyone has any questions about that. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was 
That was fascinating, actually. Thank, thanks so much for that update. Um, we have Stephen Perry with his hand up, first of all. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Chris. That's really good. Uh, just a series of related but not necessarily overlapping questions. Um, question one is, uh, if you compare the distribution of bid members according to the same sort of breakdown, retail, hospitality or whatever, uh, can anything be learnt on about who who was who was motivated to respond was a particular type of uh, retailer or uh, city centre business that was more likely to respond than others. That's one question. Uh, second question is, I, I, well, it's almost a presumption. I think you're talking about the city centre bid because I learned for the first time this week there's actually a dip a different bid uh, organisation down on the Sealand Road Bumpers Lane area. So I assume you're talking about city centre only. And the third question is. Can you drill down into the details to get responses per street or area? Because what's in my mind is that if uh, if there's a proposal, I know there are proposals to you know to close Lower Bridge Street to through traffic or or something like that. Uh, can you anticipate in any way what the response and reaction might be? Right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks very much for the questions. The first, well, the, the yes, you're absolutely right. It's the city centre bid only. Yeah. So that's the geography of it. We can, uh, we do know where the businesses are. We have the businesses' names and addresses, so we know where they are. Um, um, I suspect on your, um, but we have 30. Right. On that proposal, that would probably require a sort of separate piece of piece of work. I think most of the businesses are located um, within the pedestrianised area around the cross um, and outside on um, Fourgate Street, um, Frodsham Street, that kind of area, rather than rather than further afield. So yeah. we'd need to be careful in drawing <laughs> too many conclusions on specific proposals like that. I think that would be the honest answer. Um, question one was on who is more likely to respond. I've asked the bid for a kind of breakdown of, of their businesses by type just to see how whether there's a particular kinds of businesses that have responded. Um, I haven't I'll, I'll chase that again, but I think my gut feeling based on gut feeling is that retail responded more. But that's <laughs> that's just a gut feeling. There's no actual evidence for that. I would have expected a bit more response from hospitality, uh, but it, it may just reflect. Who who has have the most issues related to freight deliverers it, and. Um, uh, and and perhaps who's particularly well. No, I think that's that's basically how it is. But I need a little bit more evidence on that. Is I think the the answer to to your question to be sure whether there's a bit of bias in inverted commas in 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 one particular sector. Okay. Oh, thanks, Chris. Because obviously, you know, <clears throat> seven percent does seem a bit disappointing, as you say. There could be many reasons for that. Um, mm. It could be just that most of them have got a problem, uh, yeah. or the email's gone to the wrong person. But I think I think it's. Yes survey you've done, it would have been nice to have a bit more content really in terms of response, but well done. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there is more obviously in the. Um, uh, there'll be more in 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 the report that we'll be providing <coughs> on on collections and so on. We, we treated this we regarding the the actual precise results as it were from individual respondents as being confidential probably, um, but there is a lot more <coughs> detail available, although yes, yeah, 7% response. I was hoping for for ten percent, say uh, we didn't quite quite get there, which is a bit of a shame. Thanks very much, anyway. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so it's Christy here. Um, temporarily taking over the mantle while Councillor Shaw's had to dip off the meeting for a few minutes. Um, next, we've only got um, obviously behind schedule, so we've got two more questions. First one from John Beckett, and then from Vanessa Bond. If if that's okay, thank you. Oh, Christy, and I think that uh, Stephen and Chris have dealt with my question. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, okay. Thank you, John. Over to you then, Vanessa. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Um, no, very interesting presentation, um, Christy. Thanks for that. Um, and I hope that Craig can help you with the residence survey, because obviously we represent 
residents' associations within and nearby the city walls. Um, wow. Particular to where I live on Whitefriars at the rear is um, Common Hall Street, Pierpoint Court, and which leads into sort of Weaver Street, um, which has traditionally, since I was a child, has been used as a service area for the city. Um, I've been living here now for 12 years, having been in Manchester and London um, in the interim. And in that time, it has become more residential and it will become increasingly residential. There's a big scheme underway and deliveries take place literally 24 seven. You got, you got Fishman coming at about 20 past five. Um, and then because it's hospitality and that's increased, I think when I moved here 12 years ago, there were three licenses on on uh, Watergate Street. Now I believe there are 33, and I know this because I sit on the Purple Flag Steering Group. Um, so it was just really an observation regarding that, and particularly with the, the, the schemes that are being built out at the moment, physically the big trucks that currently use it will no longer be able to use it because they are too big and they will take the front off somebody's house. Um, already we had a, a biffer wagon take off the front of somebody's Range Rover parts on the drive um, and they'd only had it three days so they weren't happy. Um, so that was just a discussion around that but also I know that York have a pilot scheme where they, they I think they've used one of their um, sort of almost redundant park and ride sites or the least used park and ride sites as a sort of um, a, a, a depot where e-cargo bikes um, sort of distribute um, and that, I believe that started in September so I wondered if you being in the industry knew any more about that and how that's going thanks that, yeah thanks yes I mean the the we are going to be doing a survey of residents so yes for, we very um, very much welcome your your help in that um, and um, the York one um, we need to look at examples um, around the country. If it's park and ride, it sounds like it's quite a long way out. Um, but a concept we've been looking at is whether the vans could come come a little bit closer in into a suitable place and then transfer cargo to to e-bikes. But that's it's very early stage at this point. Um, because obviously the 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 cyclists, even with an electric motor, don't want to be uh, riding too far they need to be able to get there and back fairly fairly efficiently um and yeah on the 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 i i was interested in the area you were discussing um particularly because in the context of e-bikes if um not if people can just park there and walk in uh, it's very close to the pedestrianized area then that's the flaw in the the e-bike um, cycle logistics argument. That's that be my one observation on that. So that was why I was particularly interested in observing what goes on during the the time window in that area to to understand what's going on because it's an obvious place for people to park in and walk. Yeah, I think there's actually some. For, for the AMPR project, but that might be able, that might be helpful. Right, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much. Do we have any further comments or questions? Can't see any hands up. I'm just, um, just trying to check. No, there's no other hands up. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, that was really informative and it's good to see that freight freight is 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 now front and center there hasn't been a huge amount of work in recent years done on freight so it's an important part of transport strategy um and and i'm hoping that it that is a good segue into what what christie's updates will be too because we'll be talking about transport strategy more more, more widely across the borough as well so so thank you very much for your time chris it's and for your work on this thank you thank you very much bye-bye christie yeah, um, I'm just about to share my screen, sorry, so I can't see if there's any hands raised or anything like that, but um, 
put it on presentation mode that's more helpful for you isn't it so um a usual kind of catch up to agenda isn't it really but um, i've just put some points down that we were going to focus on today and the first bit is is that rose alluded to earlier about our new decarbonizing transport post officer um karen stevens so she, she had a meeting first thing but is now on the call so if i just temporarily stop sharing i think she'll be able to put herself well actually she might be able to put herself on camera uh, regardless of whether i can uh, i stop sharing but there we go over to you karen for a brief intro Hello, uh, yes. Um, yeah, as Chrissy says, I'm Karen Stevens um, and I started in November. So, yeah, two and a half months in. Um, so um, just uh, find out all the things that are going on and trying to meet as many people as possible. Um, and um, my focus um, is going to be working on um, active travel. So walking and cycling, wheeling and um, looking after the e-scooters. I'm sure many other things. <laughs> and anything else that comes your way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'm hoping... This is going to share again now. Um, brilliant. Thank you. So um, the other news that I think possibly you were alluding to at the beginning of the meeting um, was Rose is, is ducked off, hasn't she, for interviews for the head of transport. So we don't know the outcomes of that at the moment, but obviously those those uh, interviews are taking place and, and uh, obviously you'll be updated on that as soon as um, Rose and, and others know more on that. So um, that was probably the, another bit of big news that, um, that I should recount to you. Um, capability revenue funding. I know we talked about it last time, but there's a there's a lot of sort of press releases at the moment and potential some confusion about what fund it is is available at the moment. So I'll just recap on that. Bit of information on the bus service improvement plan and, and the progress we've made on that. Um, forthcoming EV strategy, local transport plan, and then just to keep you up to date on Chester City Gateway, which I know is a little bit more colloquial on the borough, but um, that there's a consultation out on that at the moment that you might want to um, feed into. So in terms of active travel um, and the revenue funding, as, as we reported last time, we, we did go through the process and take on board your point, Vanessa, about um, publicising it on the website. So we'll get that done and get the link sent out. We were awarded level one, um, which the majority of the local authorities fell into. And as a result of that, we received £128,148 from um, active travel England for capability um, revenue funding. Um, Act to Travel England advised that local authorities at level one pitch their funding towards capability and capacity, not behavioural change activities. So that's kind of the, the, the guys that we're in at the moment. And then just for information is, is the table I presented last time. So we're working on this side of the, um, sorry, this side of the um, table in terms of, you know, network development, enhancing our LC work plans, scheme planning and design, public engagement data and evidence collection, um, which absolutely feeds into all those sort of discussions that uh, Chris was talking about, pedestrianisation and the sort of use, use of the city centre and other town centres as well. So um, that, that's where we're focusing our um, revenue funding on. Before we submitted, we had to um, we had to give an idea of where we wanted to spend the money as well within the within the funding grant. So that's why we've got the 128 and and it is allocated already in terms of the areas that we're going to um, progress. Uh, the bus service improvement plan, uh, we refreshed ours. Clearly, we didn't get any funding in the first round um, and we're not sure there's any further funding on the horizon, but we've refreshed ours in order to uh, present a shop window for the local uh, for. Department for Transport so that it, it clearly knows where operators and the local authority aim to be in terms of bus service improvements going forward. Um, you may or may not be aware of the £2 fare cap which has been uh, released after after Christmas, um, 1st of January by DFT, so that's badged under the Help for Households um, as a bid to try and encourage more people back to bus post-Covid. Um, so, so hopefully you're aware of that and hopefully you, you're utilising those offers. Um, and then a bit of a sort of... Um, looming deadline is is the bus recovery grant and local transport fund from department for transport will end on the 31st of march 2020 23 in fact sorry um and um we are we are awaiting further guidance from dft whether that will continue um we we need to we need that assurance on the basis that we we, we can't um we need to make sure the bus services are coherent that they're getting to pe people to places they want to be and that there's no service cuts as a result so you know we're, we're, we're lobbying um, DFT and in, in the meetings that we have for them to continue those funding streams so that we don't suffer any cuts to the services that we have um, you know they're, they're fragile across the country really. Um, last time we mentioned a bus user group that we were looking to to um, progress and we have had a number of people registering interest in our 
in, in being on that, we need a broad cross section of, of um, geography and demographics as well. So anybody interested in that, let me know. Um, we, we've we asked for people to contact us via our, our enhanced partnership email address, um, which I can pop in the chat. We're also undertaking on the basis of, you know, collection of data and evidence. We're undertaking an extensive survey across the borough with bus passengers um, at key locations, and that will start in January, February. So if you happen to be at the Chester Bus Interchange or, or any sort of other interchange and, and are asked questions, that would be really useful. Um, you know, if, if you could comply and, and speak to our surveyors, that'd be really great and helpful. Um, in terms of bus service improvement plan, we also did a bit of promotion on the park and rides. So we've we've changed some of our um, social media and um, we've um, put VMS signs on the network. So we've experienced a, a, a bit of an uplift in terms of passenger usage um, in response to the new market opening, which has been a great success, and also in in respect of you know Christmas shopping in the city centre as well. Um, and in the meantime, we've also named our Royal Mobility Fund service, which is hoping to start in in. March um, as hop on. So that's that's a brief update in terms of bus service improvement plan. EV strategy, I think um, Steve Densley covered a lot of this information in terms of exploration. Um, you know, we've got you know the sale of petrol and diesel cars coming to uh, to an end in the fourth in the future. Um, and there's a real need to make sure that the council you know provides its role in, in EV charging infrastructure. Um, supporting private sector rollout as well and promoting EV uptake. So in response to that, we've developed an EV strategy. Um, at the moment, it's draft. We're looking that looking to um, put it out for consultation in February. So we'll make you aware of that. But we obviously need to be cognizant of, you know, avoiding obstructions on cycleways, highways and pavements, um, and also um, introducing car parking when where car parking is not currently allowed, avoiding car parking, I should say, uh, and making sure that we meet accessibility standards as well in any sort of uh, approach that we take. Um, so just to mention that really on the horizon, we will be in touch in terms of consultation um, when we know more detail. And then the real biggie for us, really, um, Jack, who started in October, you briefly met, met, met at the last meeting. Um, he'll be embarking on our local transport plan refresh. So um, local transport plans are back on the government's agenda. Um, guidance from 2009 has been revised and, and you know, they won't report the plan to be more um, reflective of spatial planning, so um, planning policy and bringing together transport policy and planning as well for the local transport plan. Um, you know, we need we need to revise them. The last one we did was in 2017. It was a refresh. And to be honest, it was a light touch refresh. So a lot of the information within it is out of date. We lacked a, an implementation plan and some of the policies um, need refreshing and updating as part of that. A big part of the local transport plan is quantified carbon reduction um, and guidance is awaited from DFT on that at the moment. Um, but we will have to sort of quantify the carbon outputs from the plans that we're putting forward on transport. Um, because it's our shop window, it's where we bring together all the other documents, daughter documents that will sit underneath it. So the EV strategy, the bus service improvement plan, we need to make sure they're aligned with the poverty emergency, with the climate emergency and all the other policies that the council, um, you know, holds dear and is trying to um, make a difference on as well. So it really has to be that coherent link between transport and other sectors of the, the organisation. Um, so it will be strongly aligned with with other daughter documents. Um, I think this is just a bit of a recap of what we said, but um, it's going to be, it is a statutory document. Um, we need to make sure that um, the transport that we put forward is safe, it's integrated, it's efficient, it supports the economy, um, and that we support the needs of people living and working and visiting our borough, um, and also freight as well as, as Chris um, gave us a brief uh, introduction on previously. So all those things are coherent and, and, and linked into the plan. Um, the LTP, LTP4 as it will be known, um, it will be a 10 year plan um, and it's envisaged that it will be developed in parallel with the lo new local plan um, that, that that's planned. <laughs> um, we are a strong emphasis on decarbonisation, so through that quantified carbon reduction, and we also need to make sure that it takes on the poverty emergency, inclusive groups, sustainable transport and all those other aspects as well. Um, we're at the early stages at the moment, the sort of timeline that we're looking at at the moment is, you know, setting our visions and objectives in spring, um, 
preparing a draft LTP for in winter 2023-24 and then formal consultation uh, next spring, summer. Uh, in between those sort of vague timelines, there is an awful lot of work to be done and uh, those timelines may slip or they may, there's an awful lot of, a lot of work that goes in in between that. So there'll be some feedback at this group um, as we move forward as well. So appreciate a lot of things I've, I've talked through are, are, are quite thick and fast and, and um, there's probably a lot more layers that need to be added to this and, and we will come back to the group on those. But the final point I just wanted to raise um, was the Chester City Gateway consultation. So this is literally just a copy of the, um, con the consultation email that went out to several stakeholders. So I just wanted to make sure that um, people around the table were aware of this and if they wanted to partake in the consultation process, they can. There's a number of drop-in in sessions, um, which some of which have already happened, um, but some um, happened at the Story House at the weekend as well, and some today as well, Whole Community Centre. Um, I can pop these email addresses in the chat if that's helpful, um, but I'll stop sharing there so I can um, see if anyone has any raised hands or questions or apologies, a bit of a speed through that, but I'm conscious of time. Thanks, Christy. That 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 was um, a very quick answer, but so much information there, um, and there will be a lot of questions. I, I just wanted to, and so thank you for that. I just wanted to come back to the EV strategy because you you talked about the briefly about the local transport plan and the timeframes, but I don't think we mentioned timeframes on the EV strategy. Um, and I'm aware that the intention is to consult on it before the next set of elections. So hopefully we'll be hearing something very soon about when that will be beginning. But these are all things which uh, because people will want to know how they can be involved and and what what they need to do. So these are all things which I think we could probably circulate to this group yeah, once we know. Absolutely. I, I meant to mention, apologies if I didn't, but I meant to mention that we're looking at sort of consultation February time, so it's it's looming, so we'll, we'll need to get our ducks in a row for that as well, but absolutely this group will be um, a channel for that. And just so people know um, as well, we obviously have climate emergency funding, so um, I'm not saying that we're going to have, um, uh, you know, a, a, an endless pot of money, but there will be some opportunity for funding for EV, for EV parking and, and on the, on the in quite some time, the last time that we did a full exercise in, in this way. Has moved on significantly since then, so it, it's the time is right to do it and it and it will be um, all wide, but with the. Um, how to describe it, people will be concerned about different towns and different areas of the borough and rural areas as well, so there will sitting beneath that be a smaller version of a local transport plan for each locality area as well that's my understanding there's implementation plans as well which i think is yeah. what you're referring to and then yeah. it's, it's as you were saying about bringing together the spatial planning planning policy and transport together which obviously transcends the whole borough doesn't it as well um but i suppose the other point to raise is about there's a lot of work to do in terms of data and evidence gathering so clearly the census we just had is 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 not very useful. Um, obviously, smack bang in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, the data that we probably would have used previously, um, some of it might not always be might not be relevant to what we're trying to um, agree uh, achieve. So, we will need to do our own data gathering as well and evidence gathering in preparation for the plan. I mean, just to come back on that, I would have thought the census uh, data would be helpful in understanding populations and their needs. But yeah, absolutely. But well, sorry, in terms of some of the you know travel habits and things like that, then obviously yeah. those kind of aspects are slightly diluted in that in that. Uh, okay. Thanks, Christy. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll mute now and just bring others in because their voices are more important. Uh, so Steve Densley, more important than than me speaking. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's not really a question, but more than an offer than anything else. Um, you may actually already be aware, Christy, that I've got some um, available capacity in terms of workload for at least the next month, possibly more um, that I want to use to support the uh, the, the local council uh, in terms of active travel. Um, so that will include uh, sustainable transport, modal shift, public transport, connectivity, wayfinding, that sort of thing. Um, so really, just to make you aware, I, I, I have some availability and, and please tap into it while it is available. Um, thank you, appreciate the offer and uh, Karen and I are already um, working away behind the scenes to how we can harness your help. <laughs> That's really helpful, thank you. Thank you. Very, very kind offer Steve, thank you, much appreciated.
OK, um, John Violet. Well, thank you for that, Christy. Regarding the local transport plan, um, does the cycling strategy form part of it? Um, I presume you're coming to the point that the cycling strategy is, is out of date and probably needs updating, uh, but it would sit under the, the local cycling walking infrastructure plan definitely sits underneath it. I think Karen and I need to, obviously Karen's only in been in post a couple of months, so I think there's a, an element of trying to prioritise and put our ducks in a row, but yes, I think the cycling strategy would sit underneath that. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that because I say there's, there's quite a few um, changes I think need, needed in that respect, but uh, maybe this is the time to start looking at it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And sorry, John, just while I've got your attention, um, we are looking at the A51 um, route, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the name of the road, um, the pedestrian island you mentioned last oh, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got that out to design at the moment, so okay. it might not be delivered um, before the end of the financial year, but we're certainly getting that um, uh, oh, looked at for the moment. Thank you very much. Apologies. John Beckett, I think so. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, John. John? Um, thanks, Christy. It was a very comprehensive presentation. Just a, a point, uh, just on the last comment you made uh, about the A51. The key issue with the A51, as you probably know, is the air quality down the road, OK? And the fact that the um, uh, major improvement uh, at Bridge Trafford has shunted the uh, queue down through the middle of Littleton. Uh, that's now exposed to quite high levels of not only nitrogen dioxide, but PM 2.5. And I just want to raise a bigger issue. We're just about to hear the result of the National Consultation on Air Quality, which will drop the NO2 um, targets from 40 to something between 40 and 10, 10 being the World Health Organization limit and the PM 2.5 limit from 25 down to something between 25 and 5, 5 being the World Health Organization limit. This issue is a sort of a juggernaut coming down the road um, because the a lot of the routes <clears throat> around Chester alongside roads expose uh, pedestrians and cyclists to levels that are well above the World Health Organization levels. And once they get dropped, there'll be some difficult problems to resolve. I don't know what the answers are myself, actually. Um, so, for example, the A51 and the A41 uh, run at about 30 or 40 milligrams per meter cubed of NO2. If that limit's dropped, it means that the cycle paths and the footpaths are uh, a dangerous places to be, quite frankly, unless you can do something about the HGVs. So, John, some John, is there a question strategy. in there? Sorry, it's just that I think I'm, I think I think you, you're right to raise this issue, but I think there are there is a meeting scheduled for next month to discuss the detail of it, isn't there, with Jane Black? And I'm just wondering. Um, not not on air quality that I'm aware of, Karen. Right. And unless okay. you know something, I don't. What I'm saying is that this strategy for transport needs to have an okay. air quality component. Okay. Because Understood. the limits are all dropping, and routes that are considered to be safe now may not be safe in the future. LTP definitely yeah. we obviously have and regular conversations. I can only reinforce still sitting on the side a southeast Chester cycling plan that was prepared by volunteers that we haven't reviewed with CWAT yet which is about two years old so um, I'll just leave you with those thoughts but uh, a very interesting presentation thank you very much Christy. If, if I can just come back quickly, sorry. Um, obviously, we're having conversations with our quality officers. We've got monitoring on the A51. So at the moment, it, is, it isn't exceeding. I take your points about uh, pollution created by uh, vehicles. I'm going to keep an eye on that. We've done monitoring as part of the scheme um, and we're getting our machine recalibrated uh, and re, re um, posted, if you like, back on site. Um, the other point to make, sorry, in just in relation to your um, later comments about the South East Chester study that obviously got considered in the Satan camp piece of work that we've done. Um, I didn't put Satan camp on the agenda today. It'll probably come to a further meeting because I do need to arrange a meeting with, with the interested parties and parishes, which clearly you'll be involved in. So I didn't want to put any information out um, before the, the concerned parties have access to it. So I'll be in touch on that very shortly. No, that that's great. But just Back on your point on air quality, uh, Christy, you're right at the moment, the A41 and the A51 are sitting very tightly against the, the current limits. Once they drop, the exposures will be higher than the new limits. Um, yeah. it's, it's a big issue, that's all. OK, so thank you very much. OK, John.
I understand the point you're making now. Um, I thought I thought you were referring to the other other work streams we've got ongoing. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, OK, do we have any other questions for Christy on any of the updates? Christy, can I just make a request that, um, you know, you mentioned about sending out the information on the consultations, the EV strategy EV. and the local. Yeah, um, and I know I know that the local transport plan consultation is not going to happen this side of the election, but the other no. one will. Could we yeah. just make sure that we do circulate that to this group? Yeah, we'll do. That'd Definitely. be brilliant. Thank yeah. you. OK, any any other comments or questions for Christy? Vanessa? Now, this is just generally a question. Does anybody know who Ray or Roy Noonan is? The reason I ask is that they made a donation to the AppFest campaign. Um, and it wasn't somebody that certainly within our working group, we knew who it was. So I'm wondering if anybody else on the call might know. I don't know. Do you know? Do you know anybody of that name, Christy? I don't, but I'll look through my emails later and see if uh, it comes up. Yeah. Thanks. We do, we do have we do have an officer with the surname Noonan, but I'm sure the name isn't Ray or Roy, but we can check. <laughs> OK, thanks. Mystery man. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, John, do you want to come back in? Is your hand still up? Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, um, I should have taken it down. My problem. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so any other business and or questions that or issues that people would like to raise? I know we've overrun slightly, so. Um, Helen. Uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for my camera to come on. Um, yeah, it was, just, it was just a general question. Um, I'm secretary of Upton by Chester Community Group, so we were observers of STTF and very keen on improving active travel for people locally. Um, it was about planning and the planning system and whether there should be more uh, more input around active travel into planning. Um, but what I didn't note was the bus stop, the route had disappeared a couple of years ago. So actually there were only three buses during the day on weekdays and the shops, you couldn't get to them because there was no crossing on a busy road and there were no tactile curbs. And I noticed on the Countess of Chester planning application, which is really exciting actually, obviously that has a big impact on residents with, with the traffic that goes there. And it's quite nice to see that the council are going to be working with the hospital to put in an effective travel plan. But I did notice that it was Chester Cycling Campaign that had to point out that there was a, a possible um, off-road route that would help with active travel. And I just wonder whether in the highways report, whether there should be more detail, you know, if there's a resource for somebody else to look at more detail around active travel rather than just the, the basic, it's got enough car parking or EV points. That was it really, I was just curious about that yeah thanks helen and that's a very good point well made and steve's helpfully put in the chat that is now uh, active travel uh, cycling groups are now um, statutory consultees but actually christy will probably know no more um sorry active travel england and are statutory consultees mm -hmm. christy will probably know more about the detail but i am aware that as part of the local transport plan we'll be looking at bringing in forward um, some um, SPDs, um, supplementary planning documents, specifically on active travel. Um, and without going into planning policy, which is very complex in in detail, but but basically with the national planning policy framework, you quite that there is a there is a, a, a parameter within which local authorities have to work, but they can bring in these local SPDs, um, which I suppose is. I don't want to use the word mandatory um, because it can be challenged by the developer or the applicant, but it would certainly give more impetus to the application if we had a policy in place that said we expect this minimum level of active travel infrastructure. So Jack Mayhew is working on that and that will definitely form a part of the new um, local transport plan. But I, I appreciate the frustration that you're expressing there and it comes up all the time on planning applications. Ka Karen, I don't know if you, Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything. You've got your hand up. 
Yeah, I just wanted to yeah just respond on that, Helen. Thanks for raising that. So that's something I'm going to start looking at, or I've started looking at um, since I've been in post. So um, yeah, I I um, understand your frustrations on on those points, um, but also and obviously um, you know SPDs will take a little while to sort of uh, be become um, adopted. So um, yeah, we we need to do that. Um, but one of the other things is that um, that Christy mentioned the capability fund that we've been awarded, um, and so part of that allocation is to um, provide training for um, sort of upskilling um, and increasing knowledge of, of council staff. So um, we'll be we'll be doing that as well. So not only kind of um, I suppose. I suppose it's to me it's sort of two things one is um obviously this, we've got ltm 120 there you know everybody talks about um so that's uh that sort of gives us um design standards but also i think it's kind of looking for those opportunities as well rather than just sort of um you know seeing what a developer presents but also thinking about what they could be presenting um so so yes yeah, so that's something that we'll be we'll be getting getting moving on shortly thank you so i i, I hope that's helpful helen but it's um most certainly on our definitely on our radar and our work plan because um, we, we 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 are as frustrated as you are sometimes with what comes out of the planning process at the moment I think is fair to say and just a quick one on the same point the Beachmore development um, uh, retirement on it sort of sits in isolation with no connectivity for uh, pedestrians and cyclists just a good worked example of what Helen said. I've got no more to say, except there needs to be some solid input to the planning function from the top, Karen. I don't know how you do that, but to ask them to uh, consider this issue, please. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 not easy for um, for uh, senior councillors to influence planning because it's completely apolitical and we, we don't have the we don't have the power of jurisdiction to do so. But the way we do that is through policy and that's why we need to change. That's why we need to update these policies to make sure they're as solid as they can be. So, I, I you know, I, I know that officers are working on that now. Um, we, we have we have got a couple of SPDs in place, but, you know, around parking and, and there's things there's, it's one on cycling now as well, isn't there, I think, or it's coming working its way through if it's not yet there. But um, I take the point you're making. Yeah. OK, okay thank, thank you. you. OK, any other any other points that anybody wants to raise under any other business? OK, well, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. And um, before we go, Christy, I don't know if we do have another date for the next meeting. And if, if we do, if we don't, it will just so, so everyone's aware it will be the last one before the next election cycle because we're about to go into another cycle of perda in march um christy i don't know if you've if we've established a date no there isn't a date set as yet i was i was discussing this with rose earlier but yes it does need to be before perda and i think possibly it might be if people have got dates that they really can't do or weeks that they're you know they're away then let us know as you can send it to me or to the transport policy inbox and then we'll work we'll put some dates forward from that basis because this one was was slightly um you know arranged around your busy and, and rose's busy diary as well which is not always uh you know so if we if we get enough time from now i think i think we should be able to to get something in plan it I ahead it, i think it'd probably be easy to give a um people about two or three dates to choose from and see which okay. one gets the most response that's that's the okay. best i think the best way to go about it okay um, and would it be better for people to it later in the day because sometimes people that are at work during the day um or, or aren't working from home can't always join when they're at this time so yeah any views on that <clears throat> on the time of it yeah i think late late afternoon is a good one isn't it okay yeah all right we'll try for that thanks very much okay thanks for your attendance today and thanks to all all, all the officers for their inputs as well and uh, we'll see you all again next time thank you take care bye bye Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.